Here today we're outside of Slater, Iowa for a field day hosted by Practical Farmers of Iowa. Also Center for Rural Affairs was a part of this and farm landowner Lee Tesdale is with us now. Lee, thanks for coming on the program and um, thanks for having us out to your farm. You might first tell our listeners more about yourself and just kind of the, the history of your farm here. All right. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, this uh, is a century farm in my family. Uh, so my great-grandpa uh, purchased this in 1884, and um, so I'm, I guess, fifth generation. Um, he survived the Civil War and uh, came home to the farm, and became successful in this area. Um, I, uh, we're, we started doing a lot of conservation on this farm uh, starting about 25 years ago. We started no-tilling, and we're in our 10th year of cover crops now. And uh, we've also done some um, edge of field practices like saturate buffers and widget bioreactors. So we're trying to be good citizens. Absolutely. So a lot of folks came out today. I think they announced around 100 people came out to the field day. Uh, I thought the, the very first uh, part was interesting where we were seeing a, a display of drones seeding cover crop here on your ground. Can you talk about, you know, this practice on the farm and some of the benefits you've seen from it thus far? Right. Well, this is the first year we've done uh, seeding with drones. Uh, it is interesting. Um, previously, we've used planes and uh, high clearance uh, machines like a Hagee. Um, we've never tried drilling after harvest because we're trying to get that growth going uh, earlier in the fall. Um, so uh, drones look interesting. Uh, I think one of the limitations is going to be seed uh, tank capacity on the drones. Uh, today they're swarming with three drones, so it makes it a little faster. Um, but I think to get a lot of seed on on quickly, um, you know, a plane or a high clearance machine is going to be faster. Uh, the drones, however, don't uh, damage the crop like a high clearance machine would, and they're more accurate than a plane. So if you could put all three together <laughs> in one in one uh, machine, that would be wonderful. So tell us more about the company that was operating the drones today. I understand that you had some folks here from Iowa. Right. So the company is called Rantizo. They're out of Iowa City, Iowa. And uh, they do, uh, I think, about two-thirds of their business, I said, is actually uh, spraying uh, crops. And then about a third is, um, is uh, cover crop seeding and other dry applications. Um, it's, it's uh, kind of an experiment and it'll uh, be interesting to see uh, in a few weeks how the germination is and the, how good the coverage is. Can you talk uh, more about, you know, over the course of the 10 years that you've been doing the cover crops on your operation, what, what are some of the benefits you've seen, you know, from, you know, from these plantings every year? Right. Well, I, I like cover crops for several reasons. Um, we're trying to keep the topsoil in place. That's probably number one. Uh, we don't want surface erosion, uh, try to limit that as much as possible. And uh, especially with cereal rye that, that goes dormant over the winter and then grows again in the spring, uh, well, it does a great job. If you get the good, a good application, it does a great job of holding the soil. And, you know, in, in March and April, you have this beautiful uh, green cover out here. Um, but also, uh, there are a number of other benefits. One is, um, is uh, soil health. So... It, when, when you have the roots in the ground, you encourage more earthworm uh, activity and uh, increasing organic matter. Then, um, and then, if you if you're grazing cattle or sheep, uh, you've got you've got all that feed, all that free feed out there. If you have fence, you need fence. Um, but and then life or uh, wildlife like it too. And um, so it's uh, there are a number of reasons to cover crop. Um, we, we're in year 10, and uh, I think we'll just keep doing it. Very good. You made me think of something. Whenever we were down the hill a little further, off in the background, folks could see some goats out around. What, what was the purpose of that there? Yeah, I knew the goats were going to come up. <laughs> so as you probably know, Farm Service Agency has just opened a CRP for haying and grazing because of the drought. So I have a tree problem in my CRP, and so uh, we've tried mowing, and we've tried burning, and there's still trees there. So we're trying uh, uh, goats on the go now. And uh, hopefully they will strip the bark on those little uh, box elder trees and, uh, and kill them. That's, that's the thought. Uh, we'll see how it works. This is the first time I've tried goats. But uh, 
ho- hopefully we'll we'll do it this time. Yeah, that, I thought that was very interesting. Um, another part of the field day, and I, we won't hold you up much longer because I know there's a lot of folks that want to talk to you. Um, talk about some of the buffer strips that you have in place and these water quality efforts on your farm. Right, so I have buffer strips, which are CRP along Alleman Creek, 50 feet on each side. And uh, we've installed one wood chip bioreactor um, about eight years ago. That's denitrifying that particular tile at about 58%. And then we put in a uh, saturated buffer four years ago on a neighbor's tile that empties into the creek on my, on my land. And that's denitrifying about 90%. And then this summer, <clears throat> we participated in this blitz, building blitz along the, uh, this, uh, in this watershed. We put in two more saturated buffers. And obviously we don't have any data yet. Uh, tiles aren't flowing, we have no idea. Uh, but, but hopefully they'll um, be similar to that that other saturated buffer we have, which is working at 90%. So what we're trying to do is, you know, there's no benefit to us uh, trying to clean up our own tile water, but it benefits people down the road, down the lo- down the line. And we would hope that people, you know, upstream from us, would take into consideration the water quality, and uh, and put in some of these practices and try to denitrify some. So we're just trying to be good citizens. Yeah, I'll leave you with this thought here, uh, or question anyway. If you were to give advice or uh, any thoughts to any growers in the state that are maybe been kicking the idea around of beginning these conservation practices, what would be some advice you would pass along to them? Yeah, I'd say a couple of things. Go to field days, see what other people are doing, uh, look online at different cost share options, um, where, which would help pay for some of these practices. Um, I would do some research, look at, look at uh, research articles that come out of the um, land-grant universities. You know, they're doing a lot of good work at Purdue, Iowa State, University of Minnesota, uh, other places. Um, you know, be, become informed, look around. Uh, you know, people are welcome to come here and look around uh, anytime. Uh, do your research, talk to other people, and then uh, and jump in. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not all that scary once you start. So. Well, again, Lee, thanks so much for having us out to your farm today. It's been a great event, and uh, stay safe and have a good rest of summer, all right? Thanks. And one last thought. Um, it's real important for landowners and operators to work together. So we know that Iowa's about 60% rented ground. Um, I would just say uh, landowners, step up, You know, be, be good citizens, work with your operator, offer to pay for the cover crop costs to get started, whatever it takes. But uh, I'd like to see a lot more landowners uh, thinking more seriously about conservation.